In other news now, the country's electricity crisis could come to an end very soon. That's according to the electricity minister, Hussein Soramukhopa, who has addressed the Green Hydrogen Summit in Cape Town. The summit is looking at how Africa can reduce its carbon footprint and how to reaffirm South Africa as a world leader in the green energy space. My colleague, Sir Heidi Jokos, is at the summit, joining us now live this hour just to give us an update. Good afternoon, Heidi. Minister Ramukhopa seemingly confident that our energy crisis could be over soon. I wonder what's driving that confidence. Good afternoon, Heidi. Good afternoon, Bradan. Yes, certainly, I would say that the minister is a lot more confident. I think also because we are seeing uh, lower stages of load shedding. But I'll get into that in a short while. I just want to bring in the minister to get a sense of the importance of uh, this Green Hydrogen Summit and what it's actually going to mean for uh, the country. Thank you so much once again for your time, Minister. We do appreciate it. Uh, just speak to us about this Green Hydrogen Summit. You know, South Africans are looking at this and going, what does this actually mean? How is it going to help us? How is it going to benefit us? But central to all of this is really trying to eliminate our carbon footprint. Oh, yes. And uh, good afternoon to the viewers back at home. So it's a second iteration of the uh, South Africa Green Hydrogen Summit. Uh, so essentially, we are looking to exploit this uh, energy carrier in the context of uh, um, increased uh, energy generation. So we have uh, what we call uh, energy intensive users. So those who produce uh, steel, those who produce cement, they are really placing a significant amount of uh, demand uh, on the grid, so they are taking a lot of account for significant amount of load. So what they are seeking to do is to find new generation sources, and green hydrogen has been found to be the most reliable uh, technology on what we call the hard to abate sectors. Essentially, you are big consumers of, uh, of uh, energy, but also it helps them. Uh, to continue to access your lucrative uh, markets in the, in the industrialized global north. We know that over time what those countries are likely going to do is to introduce what we call carbon border adjustment mechanism, essentially introducing penalties for products that want to access their market, which products have been produced by uh, what they call dirty fuel. So coal in the main uh, will rank as a dirty fuel. So it's about their self-preservation but also relieving the load. So as they relieve the load from the grid, it means that uh, the available capacity now is much higher. We can use it to uh, meet the requirements of households and uh, other users. So it's got a relationship in relation to, to load sharing. And then the second one is just to pro protect their market share. Like I say, going into the future, there might be an imposition on tariff for their products. So if they go greener, it means that they are going to protect the jobs that they are currently embedded in the sector. And then the third one is that uh, if you look at um, what the automotive sector is doing, is that uh, they are transitioning from internal combustion engine, uh, they are going to battery, they are going to f different from forms of propulsion, including green hydrogen. And today, yeah, um, BMW was able to showcase the innovation they've introduced working with uh, Anglo and Sasol with regards to a different form of propulsion for one of their vehicles. It is important that because if you look at internal combustion engine, the engine that you and I are accustomed to, the major inputs there are what we call the platinum group of metals. And just that industry uh, employs about 172,000 people. And now if you are going to discontinue the internal combustion engine, it means that those jobs are under threat because the demand will go down. But then with the introduction of green hydrogen, because it draws from the same uh, resource, uh, if you like, uh, minerals, then it means we are able to preserve those jobs. And in fact, our projection going into the future is that the demand will increase. So there are multiple uses, if you like, and uh, what we are... Uh, doing here now. It's not just um, uh, conversations in the boardroom by the enlightened and the elite, but essentially is to illustrate what uh, the kind of progress that we have made from the last uh, iteration, the inaugural uh, Green Hydrogen Summit to today. I mean, there's about eight projects that are at different stages of the project life cycle. They've graduated to the next stage from uh, the last time we we're here. The Crisca Power Reserve has moved, but also on the sidelines of this, uh, there's a memorandum of uh, 
uh, uh, understanding that is signed by the Cape provinces, Northern Cape, Eastern Cape and the Western Cape, to collaborate and create a corridor working also with Namibia so that we are able to benefit from scale and aggregation. Okay, I, I still want to ask you about load shedding. So very quickly, yes. could you just give us a time frame of when this is going to happen? Because, I mean, you speak of job creation, but many are saying that could only be in the next decade or so, and that's still a very long while from now. H how are we going to benefit from this in the immediate term? Oh, no, this, uh, a lot of them are not, uh, some of them are not uh, into 10 years into the future. I mean, uh, the Prisca Power Reserve has reached financial close. They are into the ground. Of course, they, they'll be producing green ammonia, which is a major input into the production of fertilizers so it means that uh, we are likely going to as we produce locally create jobs and um, the manufacturing of fertilizers uh, we, we are not open to the fluctuation that they have to go with the currency because we are importing from outside so it's a uh, domestically produced you are able to create uh, those jobs and I did make the point around the uh, some of the OEMs you know we've got a big present footprint of OEMs of course BMW is here and Toyota they've uh, unveiled uh, if you like uh, a, a, a form of propulsion that uses green hydrogen, I think sometime uh, uh, last week during the mobility week. So all the point I'm making is that we are protecting these jobs immediately as we be in the auto sector. But with regards to uses uh, for purposes of uh, generation, uh, Saldana, there used to be um, axolometal producing still there. Mm -hmm. Now as I speak to you now that the uh, plant uh, is closed. So those jobs are displaced. Now um, uh, axolometal working with uh, uh, Sasol, they're going to use green hydrogen to power the energy requirements and then those jobs come back. So the point I'm making is that uh, some of them are immediate, uh, medium and long term. But the, uh, the, the net result is we are going to uh, have new generation capacity because remember as we resolve load shedding we must have side of uh, energy security for the country. We don't have to have that conversation five years later. That conversation starts now. Part of the problem why we are sitting with the problem of energy deficit, we kept on kicking the can down the road. Now this has caught up with us. So we need to plan, plan immediately so that we don't um, get into a scenario where we are facing an energy crisis. And that's why it's important that we put this uh, uh, actions uh, uh, into place in motion working with the private sector. I think uh, we are going to see the net result on the jobs front, on the energy front, on the issues around decarbonization and greening the South African economy. Okay, so Minister, I received a lot of criticism a couple of months ago when I tweeted that you said that you dance for us when load shedding is <laughs> over. Yeah. And I want to ask you, is that coming sooner rather than later? Because we are experiencing a lot more lower stages of load shedding and many would attribute this to a lower demand but also people not being so reliant on the grid anymore because people have now moved over to solar but people are also attributing it to the fact that you have found a minister that understands the issue and has found the cause of the problem and is dealing with this um, would you say that load shedding is almost over or how, how does it look maybe the point to be made is that you look on the generation side available capacity now 20, 28,000 megawatts plus consistently now. Uh, so that's a significant improvement. And then, uh, of course, I did make mention of the two units of Kusile. I think one of them will be coming uh, soon, uh, sooner than what we had projected. I had said the 24th of October, we have been able to ramp up. Uh, we could be earlier, and then, of course, we will announce that uh, to you. 800 megawatts. And then the last of the three units that had gone down will come back uh, in early November, and then we'll fire unit five. So what is the point I'm making? that you are going to see that the available capacity now is going to breach 30,000 megawatts. Eh? And of course, eh, when demand goes down, it means that eh, the intensity of load shedding eh, also eh, tapers down. But the real point I want to make is that they were making significant victories, yeah. eh, small victories, but they are significant, if you like. I make the point that eh, for the Springboks to lift the Rob Ellis Trophy, <laughs> eh, to be the champions of the World Cup, they must win the quarterfinals, which we did yesterday. I'm confident we'll beat uh, uh, England. And then we'll, whoever we meet in the final, then uh, we lift the trophy. So it starts with winning um, the one stage and then followed by the other. The, we want to normalize a situation where when we get into a weekend, we say there's no load shedding. Take it back to a Friday, a Thursday. So what's the point? It's one day of no load shedding two days of no load shedding before you get to 365 days of no load shedding. So it's small steps, gradual, 
uh, but uh, essentially taking us in the right direction. And I'm confident we'll get to a scenario where we are eliminating this thing called load shedding in our vocabulary or we place it back uh, as part of uh, our past. But I'm confident about the direction we are taking. I have said that we are turning the corner. We are not yet out of the youth woods because we still need to work on additional generating capacity to help us to survive the next cycle of winter. And I'm confident with the work that we are doing with Minister Mantashe, we should be able to add another 3,000 megawatts, especially from gas, uh, outside the Kusile unit. So, so we are making the kind of progress that we want. And then uh, we go into December and then we can have our dance move when the, the lights are on. We are closer to that. Don't worry. Okay, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. That is the Minister of Electricity, Dr. Kosien Saramkhopa, just speaking to us about um, what is happening here at the Green Hydrogen Summit, but also where we are in terms of uh, the forecast when it comes to load shedding. And as the Minister keeps reiterating, we are not out of the woods just yet, but we are slowly uh, turning the corner, and I think that's crucial, uh, Bradan, given uh, what load shedding and constant rolling blackouts have done to our economy. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Heidi. I wonder what uh, dance that will be. What genre of music you and the minister are going to be dancing to? We'll have to wait and see. We're keeping our fingers crossed for that day to come sooner than later where we end low shedding. That's Heidi Joko speaking to the Minister of Electricity, Hussein Soramakopa, on the sidelines there of that uh, uh, Green Energy Summit that's taking place, Green Hydrogen Summit that's taking place in Cape Town.